quite a few new faces. Have, have you guys all heard of regenerative agriculture at this point? Okay, that's a good thing. Uh, regenerative, so I'll just recap a couple of things for those of you who are new, but I won't go into such grueling details that those of you who saw it this afternoon will get bored. So, planet's facing some serious issues right now. Climate change, pollution, human health problems. Um, and, yeah, and a lot of these we're starting to correlate back to how we're producing our food. Um, but what's really been exciting is that um, is that uh, there's a, a group of farmers that's growing that is really changing that, and they're they're calling this movement the regenerative ag movement. What these guys are doing is that they're find and gals um, are finding that these uh, that if they focus on soil health and promoting biodiversity on their farms, that they're able to grow uh, nutrient dense foods very profitably. And, and so that's what regenerative agriculture is. So tonight, what I wanted to kind of focus on is, is some of the science that we've been doing on these farms themselves, because in a lot of ways, these farmers are really <laughs> leading the charge. They're ahead of the science on so many different angles. And then I wanted to talk a little bit more about our own story and what we're trying to do with um, Blue Dasher Farm and Ignisus Foundation. This is our 501c3. And this is our demonstration farm. So without further ado, we're going to talk about uh, some work that um, some work that one of my uh, master students, Jacob Pacheca, just finished up, and we're going to talk about poop. There's a <laughs> and specifically maggots and poop. So it just gets better and better, right? <laughs> so there's a there's there's a component of this audience who when they saw this were kind of like, yeah, the cow turd pick, right? Uh, fresh steamer right there. Dung is important. Dung is important. Um, it, it is a source of parasites for our animals. It also follows pastures, but it's also a source of nutrition. Right here, this is fertilizers, right? And we like to, we like to put it in big lagoons and then pipe it back onto our land, or we like to replace it with synthetic chemicals, but in its ancestral state, this is how the next generation of plants fed itself. And it's a tremendous habitat. There's a lot of work that's been done um, on, on species of insects, invertebrates that live within poop specifically cow poop. 450 different species of insects have been found worldwide. And around the world, 30,000 species of dung beetles. 1,500 species just in North America. So we often think they're here. Um, you know, I, I'm going to try to import some dung beetles because I just don't have any dung beetles on my ranch. I'm kind of like, no, they're there. Uh, you just, you, a lot of people just don't know it all the time. So, of this tremendous diversity, less than 2% are pests. But that's, so often in this life, that's what we like, love to focus on, isn't it? When we think of biodiversity, we think of the things that we've got to kill, don't we? We wake up and we're like, all right, this thing is a problem, i got to eliminate that. But when we do that, when we put our blinders on, we ignore the, the, the majesty of the natural world, right? And that's to our detriment. That's to our detriment. And this is actually the, the other 98.3% of species that are out there have a real economic value to us. And we need to start evaluating those things uh, appropriately. So how do we manage this? <laughs> Well, we use avermectin. Avermectin is the, the that, so we talked about DDT and the man who discovered DDT won the Nobel Prize. The, the fellow who discovered avermectin also won the Nobel Prize for medicine um, because, uh, uh, you know, internal parasites are a tremendous problem for human cultures as well as for animals. Um, avermectins are a neurotoxin. They disrupt cell membranes in the nervous system of, uh, and, and they're fairly targeted toward insects and, and nematodes, and for that reason, we use them for controlling a lot of different parasites in our livestock, okay? 
So these are applied in a number of different ways. You can pour on, you know, it's, uh, you can inject, you can feed it to them. There's all sorts of ways. And the, and the ways that they use these things end up um, having a big implication for the environmental impact that avermectins might have on non-target species, on beneficial insects out in the environment. And this is applied to the majority of cattle in the U.S. right now. Okay, we're, we're using a lot of this stuff on our cows. Um, not the vast majority, but it is the majority. The, the problems with that. And one of the biggest problems is that almost all of the avermectins that we put on our cows comes out in the poo. Okay? It, um, it persists in the environment for a really long time. Um, and this is, of course, affected by so many different things in the soil and in the environment. And it's really, really effective at killing a lot of the insects, the invertebrates that live in the dung. Why is that so important? We value it, dung beetles alone at around $460 million a year. That's the services that they provide. By recycling that dung down, the dung beetles alone are extremely important and an economically valuable thing for ranchers. Um, they help to uh, reduce pasture fouling so that your pasture is equally usable by all of the different, or by, by your livestock. They reduce that the need for avermectins, okay? What causes pests? Does anybody remember from earlier today? What causes pests? Well, you got a problem. Humans do, right? Essentially, it's not enough diversity. It's simplification. That's what causes pests and disturbance. So when we reduce diversity, in our rangelands and increased disturbance in our rangelands, that's where pests come from. And maggots are an important pest. Maggots are a really important pest. They vector diseases, they're a tremendous nuisance, um, they prohibit animals from feeding. Um, it's a huge problem. So what we wanted to know is if we manage our cattle herds appropriately, how does that affect pest populations in cattle? So what we did is we visited a range of different uh, uh, ranches that were managing their herds using different approaches. Um, what we're calling regenerative are ranchers that try to mimic the, the, the patterns of grazing that ancestral ruminant herds used to have, where it's a flash graze and then a long rest period. Okay. So these 16 ranches in eastern South Dakota actually represent a range of different practices on their operations, but we were able to group them into various tiers in terms of their, their effects. So these regenerative branches do not use any avermectins, and they have high stock densities, and they move those animals frequently. The conventional ranches sometimes would leave their, their animals on a particular pasture the entire season, they have a fairly low stock density, and then they apply the avermectins both in the fall and in the spring to control parasites. Okay. Yep. And we went out, and we collected bugs, lots of bugs. Um, so for this, what we did is we took a golf cup cutter, which is not what they were designed for, and we drilled through poop. And we collected the turds, and we bring them back into the laboratory, and we put them into these cylinders, and then we warmed them up. So if they didn't stink bad enough, we decided we should warm these suckers up. This was by far the smelliest and nastiest project that we've ever run in, the, in, the, in, in our laboratory. Uh, <laughs> We got poop on everything. <laughs> uh, but as, as those pets uh, warmed up, what happens is that all of the insects try to escape the light. And so we're able to collect a lot of the diversity that lives inside of the turds, but down here. And then we can sort through and identify all of those different species. And we did. Just for this chapter, Jacob, uh, his thesis, he identified more than 116,000 insects down to species level. Wow. For his thesis, almost 200,000 insects. 
That's a tremendous, this is the most comprehensive bio-inventory of turds that we have. <laughs> um, it's really, uh, we uh, estimate that in a particular cow path, there's more than 400 insects. There's a lot of critters in there, isn't it? It's a lot. 172 insects were found in cow paths just in eastern South Dakota. That is a ton of diversity. Ton of diversity. The species richness, the number of species in each of those uh, ranches. This is the diversity. So here we have the regenerative. These are the ranches that kind of fell in the middle. And these are the conventional ranches. Species diversity was significantly reduced in the insect community by the abramectins and conventional management. Diversity was also reduced. Okay. I'm going to talk about why that diversity is so important in a few minutes, for those of you guys who missed it earlier. Just a clarifying question. Are the insects in the poop when it leaves the body of the animal? No. Or coming up from Within the minutes, house? these insects end up colonizing that path. So they're not coming out of the animals, you know, the poop shoot. They're coming out and they're finding it very soon after. Okay? And they're, they're in tune, right? They're in tune with that. Because um, it is. It's such a great resource for a lot of bugs. There's a lot of nutrition in, in poop. The insects are in the soil or the air or a little bit of both. Everywhere. Yep, they're kind of all over the place, and they're just finding these paths. Um, especially things like the specialists, like flies and dung beetles, within minutes. But then that insect community really changes. Yeah, they're great smellers. Yeah. That insect community changes as the path ages, and I won't get into that so much, but that's a really cool database, too. That, that was another aspect of this thing. I mean, the reason there's 172 different species is because as that pat ages, each group of insects specializes on the first two days. And then there's another group of insects that specialize on the days two through five, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that until they are able to exploit those resources. Does it follow the bell curve? For what? For the, pot, for the numbers of insects that are in the cow pie. In other words, there's a small number at the very beginning. And no. Mid Nope. What happens is right at the very uh, so how does the how does that uh, how does that population end up happening over time in the path? Does it start? Well, I suppose it depends on where you. Just, I think it's more like this, where it's got a long tail. So um, what happens is that in the first two days, if you don't get a lot of colonization. I mean, your pet just doesn't degrade very well. And so um, you've, got this, you've got this situation where you want early, early colonization by these specialists, and then those open it up for so much of the rest of the season. Right. Maggots were significantly higher in the insecticide-treated animals. That's not supposed to happen, right? We're reacting to those pests. We're, control We're in the ones in control, right? <laughs> That's why we buy this stuff, is to keep us in control. Predator abundance is here. Each of these is a turd. This is abramectin. These are predators of the maggots. As abramectin in the poo goes up, you see the predator populations go down. And this ratio of maggots per predator, you want a lot of pre uh, predators for every maggot. And so you see that there's a lot more maggots per predator up here. The predators can't control all those maggot populations in the conventionally managed treatment. What's going on here? What's going on here? Why is this happening? What we're saying is these ranchers didn't just abandon insecticides from their operations. What these ranchers did is they replaced insecticides with good management. And they didn't need the insecticides anymore. Okay. The, insectis the, inse the pest problems were telling them something about their system, weren't they? By their very definition, insecticides are an addiction. The more you use, the more you need. 
Who wins in an addiction scenario again? <laughs> yeah. 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 The, the addict, right? It's not the addict. <clears throat> Pests aren't the problem, folks. If you have a pest in your field or in your yard or something, identify the underlying problem. Stop reacting to the symptoms. Okay? Because there's a lot of people that are winning off of you reacting to symptoms. And it ain't you. Got to change the system. Change how you're managing your system to address that central problem. What is the problem? Not enough diversity, too much disturbance. We've got to get diversity back into our food production systems. How do you do this in, in rangelands? How should ranchers proceed without pesticides? Number one, you've got to stop using pesticides, okay? The parasitic side. You've got to cut cold turkey, but that's not sufficient, all right? Because you're going to have problems if you don't accompany that with good management. What is good management? High intensity grazing, you flash graze it. You put a lot of animals together very closely, you hit it hard, and then you move on. And then you allow, after those animals have moved on, you allow a long rest period, and the plant community resurges. It's used to that, right? This is what the plants and animals evolved together, to work together. And when that happens, suddenly you start using your rangelands as a carbon sink. You start using your rangelands to conserve and promote biodiversity. You start growing soil on your rangelands, and you're growing healthier beef. Right? Everybody wins in this situation. It is a disturbance, but it's a punctuated disturbance. Right? And punctuated disturbances, we talked about this a little bit more this morning, in a pasture system, is kind of a necessary thing. So when we're dealing in cropland where there's been so much disturbance through tillage and, and, and agrochemical use, You've got a situation there where we just need to stop. You know, we've got to stop with the disturbance situation. And then finally, I think that the a really key aspect of this combating pests without pesticides is integrating these herds. Have you guys ever seen the, the short film, um, 100,000 Beating Hearts, um, about Will Harris? If you haven't seen this, you need to get on YouTube. Like, you should leave this talk right now and go and watch that. <laughs> Uh, that guy is my hero, and he's got some really good, fun opinions on how to integrate herds and why you do it. And he brings up pest management. But I mean, this guy has just totally changed his whole community as a result of adopting regenerative practices. 172 species in cow pats. God, the complexity of that system. Right? The complexity of those interactions, all of those species are tied together. How do you make sense of that? Especially when you're trying to solve problems on your farm. How do you make sense of that complexity in the natural world? We decided to try and approach um, this. Trying to answer pest management questions using biological network theory, network analysis. What we were trying to do is we relied on the, uh, the statistical approaches that they use in the social um, sciences to try to understand things like how social networks develop. You know, seven degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon. You guys all heard of that, where everybody in this room, or all actors are all interacting with, or have all worked indirectly with Kevin Bacon through seven acquaintances or seven film titles or something like that. So, or how does information travel through the World Wide Web so that they know that you, know, you were just on your Facebook can tell you know, that you just ate a taco for supper or something like this, right? How does that information get through? We decided to apply those same statistical approaches to trying to understand complex biological networks. So what, what our perception of these biological networks would include things like food webs. For example, that's a network. 
Our understanding of these networks, what comes from simplified systems, we take a black plastic pot, and we put it out there, and then we put a corn plant in there, and then we put a pest, and then a natural enemy, and then we see what happens, right? But that, and that gives us some information about what's happening, you know, how insects interact, how plants and insects interact, and things like this, but it ignores the complexity of the natural world. So here's, a, here's an example. So you've got your, you've got your corn plant right here, the black plastic pot. And then you've got this guy. These cute little guys, uh, uh, these are the European corn borers. The dreaded pest of corn. So you can hate these. You're allowed to hate these cute little guys because they are the scourge, right? They drill into corn plants and then they hollow out the stalk and the stalk falls over and, and reduces yield. And yeah, we, we developed BT corn to combat this pest originally. And then you've got these little lady beetle larvae. So ladybugs, lady beetles, that's their larvae. They like to eat the, they, they like to eat these guys. And this, this is a parasitoid wasp. Most animals on earth are wasps, species wise, right? Um, for every insect species that's out there, there's a species of wasp that stings only it. They live as parasites inside. So most of the little black gnats that you see flying around are actually small wasps. They don't sting people, they sting other insects. So this, this is Macrocentris, and she, she's flying around, and she sees the cornfield, right? And then she gets her antennas out, or antennae out, and she starts, because she's smelling with those, right? She uses those to smell with. And then she finds where on, there's no external signs of the European corn borer, but she senses she senses where that corn borer is inside of the stalk. And she takes her stinger and she drives it into the stalk and into the caterpillar inside and lays an egg. And that egg hatches and devours the caterpillar from the inside out. Oh, it's pretty cool. <laughs> it's pretty cool. So this is a network, right? This is our food web for corn. This is what I was trained as an entomologist. This is what we focus on. You've got your pest, and you've got a couple of natural enemies that you should be thinking about, because those are the magic bullets that are going to control this thing, right? This is an actual interaction network from corn. Uh, we made this. This was a royal pain in the ass. We sampled 53 corn fields around eastern South Dakota and did full bio inventories of each one of them. And we counted all 107 species of insects and then we did statistical analyses to see when these things were going, if they were numerically correlated with one another, we would draw a line. So each dot is a species, right? And this, maybe this one here, this number 55, this is your pest. We'll say that. This is pest. So that's, okay, ignore all of this stuff. Get rid of, this is the one we're worried about. But what we forget when we put our blinders on is that species are connected to species that are connected to species. And that really, the whole reason that we have number 55 is because of this. This is where our management needs to be at. Okay. Each dot is a cornfield. We see species diversity here. We see pest density here. Cornfields that have high species diversity do not have pests. When you reduce species diversity, that's where you have all of your pests. Down here, we see community evenness. That means that for all of these different insect, 107 species, they're all at equal levels in there. That's an even community. When we have even communities, we do not have pests. When you reduce that and you see species going up and down numerically, that's where your pests come from. Uh, remember that big ball of spaghetti noodles? Well, this is, I pulled out the main components of that. So this is a cornfield that has very low pest abundance. Look 
at all of the connection. Look at them all. These species are interacting with each other all over the place. This is a cornfield that has high pest abundance. Where did all the interactions go? It's broken. There's even a pentagram in there. It's a sign of the devil. <laughs> right? I said that joke down in the, it was in the Bay Area a few months ago, and, um, and a lady came up afterwards and she was like, I was really offended by the pentagram joke. Um, I'm a witch, and it's not the sign of the devil. I'm like, oh, give me a break. <laughs> give me a break. There's one in every crowd. Didn't I used to work for you at the USDA? <laughs> Uh, average degree, so this is the connectivity as we get more connected cornfields. Uh, we find that the, these the cornfields simply don't have the pest anymore. Mm. And that when you break those connections, that's where your pests come from. How do you increase species diversity in cornfields? <laughs> plants. Plants. Understory plants. Lots of different plants. How do you reduce diversity in cornfields? Herbicides, fungicides. You know, buy a jug. It doesn't matter what's on the name. Just buy a jug and spray it out there. That's how you reduce insect diversity. Here's Claire. She's another one of my master's students. Um, this paper was uh, that she just published uh, two and a half weeks ago, I think, uh, is probably the most important piece of work that I will ever be associated with. Um, in one day, this paper went into the 99th percentile of all scientific research ever published in terms of social media impact. Wow. One day. That thing lit, lit on fire, and you know what? You ain't going to get this from any place else unless you support it. Okay? That's the kind of science we're doing right now. Hmm. What she did is she went out into farmers that were farming cornfields regeneratively. And, those, and, and she, these were best management practices. So she went to the regenerative leaders and she said to them, point us to, our, point us, point us to your cornfield. And so we, they did, and we went out and we sampled those, right? And then we said, okay, point us to your neighbor who's farming conventionally and, and, and doing a good job. And, and they did, and we went over there, and we, and, we, and we sampled those. This was in North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Minnesota. So regional focus and a systems level focus. So these practices that these regenerative and conventional guys were using were different. Right? Practices were different, but there were some unifying characteristics. Number one is that there were no insecticides used on the regenerative cornfields, sometimes for decades. And then on the conventional cornfields, all of them were genetically modified, with, uh, producing BT corn, which is uh, it's genetically modified to have an insecticide, uh, insecticidal gene in the, in the genome. And then they were also all treated with neonicotinoid insecticide seed treatments. You guys know neonics? No. You guys hear about these? No. They're a seed treatment, and then the developing plant sucks them up, and it's protected from herbivory. We went out to each of these cornfields, and we did a full bioinventory. We took all of the bugs from the plant, we dissected out the plants, we went onto the soil surface and we sucked up everything that was living on the soil surface with these little pooters. We call them aspirators. The English call them pooters. Name. And then we took and we drilled down and we used those Berlazi systems that I showed you with the, that we used with the poop. We used the same thing to study the insects in the soil cores. And then we did yields and profits on each of these fields. Okay. So what did we find? Insecticide-treated cornfields had 10 times more pests than untreated fields. 
That's not supposed to happen. Right? That's man bites dog kind of headlines there. Everything that I was taught as a scientist was that this doesn't happen. Was what? This doesn't happen. That you have to wait. You have to stand by and you wait until you see the insect pest because it's inevitable. And then you react. You react to that pest. And what these guys were saying is that, you know what? I don't even care about the bugs anymore, the bug pests anymore. I'm just focusing on soil health and getting diversity in my system. And the insect pests aren't a problem. I don't even worry about it. <laughs>